good day to everyone uh, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our uh, guest uh, for the world federation neurology youtube channel and social media team and world brain he, world brain day team today he actually doesn't need uh, introduction to the global community you know him very well but today we are going to open up his heart uh, and uh, get to know how he was made to this world and how he managed to did uh, and continue to do all these things so the idea is uh, to inspire as many people as possible wherever you are uh, this is uh, professor jeff donan the first ever president of uh, the world, world stroke organization that would be correct jeff uh, that's and correct also, thanks uh, jessa the almost uh, almost all the stroke gurus uh, i should say anywhere in the world uh, Uh, have had something to do with jeff uh, during during their career including myself <laughs> jeff a very good evening to you thank you so much for accommodating your time to chat to uh, our ambitious agenda the world brain day the theme and this year we thought that uh, we would talk to as many uh, the the neurologist as possible and then post them on our youtube channel for people to see how are you today thank you tesser it's a pleasure to talk to you Jeff, uh, the you have an illustrious career, uh, but it wasn't uh, very illustrious uh, when you began to do stroke uh, medicine-related things. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but before we get there, tell us uh, how you become interested in medicine and how you end up uh, as a neurologist. Uh, take us through the journey. Well, that's a Tisa. That's a very very interesting question. Uh, I'm sure we all have a different. uh journey uh but uh i um when i was a boy my my father was an engineer mm-hmm. and my grandfather was a doctor mm-hmm. uh and uh, my interest was always in um maths and physics and things like that although i always um was a voracious reader as well uh so i was torn between um uh the two disciplines and you can imagine having two uh male figures in the family like that <laughs> uh, was not an easy decision and i changed it uh, a number of times so uh i think for uh, all all the right reasons i eventually decided to do medicine rather than engineering although i must say for the first uh four years or so i felt um not not quite at home with with medicine because of my my interest in in engineering but uh, as soon as i got to the clinical side of medicine i thought wow uh, this is exactly what i want to do and i was absolutely uh, enthused by it and i think because um, you felt that you were doing something tangible and something something worthwhile and i think a lot of people who do medicine have that that sense that what what you're doing you're not doing uh banking or uh even engineering although there are a lot of very good things associated with that but with with medicine i feel you you really do um have the ability to make a difference both at the individual level which initially attracted me to medicine and uh, then as time went on making a difference at a at a at a, a broader level Uh, absolutely jeff at what stage did you become interested in brain what was the spark to get into neurology when it wasn't a very uh, the the pardon my pardon the pun when it it wasn't a very sexy specialty and uh, there wasn't even uh, the job prospects uh, at that time but you still uh, took a gamble and decided to do do neurology while everyone else was uh, trying to go through general medicine where there were ample amount of jobs uh, Uh, correct me if i'm wrong but during your time there were there was no guarantee that you would get a neurologist uh, position certainly in exactly. melbourne exactly that's right because um in those days uh, positions were very very tight uh, but I, i think the thing that really attracted me to to neurology was the um uh, was the ability was was basically the clinical examination there was something about it that uh, really appealed to me and this was in the pre imaging days where uh you could um by uh doing a very uh, thorough clinical examination step back and say i think um 
the, the problem is in, in this part of the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Uh, and if in the central nervous system, even without imaging, you might be able to uh, pinpoint it to within a, a centimetre or two, which uh, I just found absolutely fascinating. And I, I didn't think in any other clinical discipline was this uh, wonderful um, art form uh, that would enable you to um, make such a um, precise diagnosis just by talking to the patient. And as we know, 90% of the diagnosis is from the history. Uh, but then by the examination to pinpoint it further, I found to be just riveting. And in those days, of course, uh, there weren't many therapies, uh, although they were just coming in uh, and uh, the, the ability to be able to uh, intervene in some way also was, was quite appealing. And uh, the, you didn't have any pressure from your better half at that time to choose uh, a much more lucrative specialty rather than <laughs> urology at that time? Or? No, I, I think from all of our better halves uh, and partners, uh, it, it was more a, um, a pressure to uh, certainly, certainly to make a living, but it was more the, uh, the academic versus the non-academic pathway rather than neurology, not neurology. So... Mm -hmm. And for me, it was never going to be anything but a more academic pathway. I just found it, uh, everything about academic medicine to be uh, incredibly stimulating. And I didn't want to, uh, well, well, I can see that there are very rewarding pathways, not in academia, in, in medicine. I, I, I felt the way for me was um, the academic route. The, the, uh, the, you took those risks and then you did neurology and uh, the, tell us about uh, your uh, research uh, exposure and uh, the, how you managed to get into, again, a very neglected, uh, untouched field uh, at that time. Who were your mentors at that time who helped you to feed your spark and curiosity and enthusiasm? Well, I was incredibly fortunate in that uh, I always wanted to, as I was saying, to um, answer questions about, um, about the brain, about uh, neuroscience. But I had an inspirational mentor in um, Peter Bladen, who was director of neurology at the Austin Hospital. And he took me under his wing uh, in, for whatever reason, I don't know, but thank goodness he did. Uh, and I found his ward rounds to be uh, inspiring. At the end of it, uh, I, would, I would feel, gosh, we've, we've, we've got to do something about this. He'd point out the problems that were unsolved. And uh, I think it takes a particular type of person and mentor to be able to do that to you. And I, I, I just felt absolutely inspired by by Peter Bladen and, and not only that, but in the field of stroke. I think that was um, in those days, uh, things were starting to happen in stroke in a, in a very, very minor way, but uh, it, it seemed uh, anything was possible in stroke. There was so much to be done that remained undone. There was no coordinated stroke care at that time, and there was absolutely no treatment for stroke at that time. Am I correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, but at, <laughs> that was uh, in 19, um, 1977, I started my training uh, with Peter. And um, that year and the year following, uh, particularly with Peter, but assisted by me in a, in a more, um, I, was, I was the registrar, uh, we started off a stroke unit at the Austin Hospital. It was Australia's first uh, stroke unit in 1977-78. And I've still got the, all the records of, um, we used to record every patient that came through the door. And there was enormous resistance to us setting up a stroke unit, massive. Um, in fact, the, um, the, uh, the residents went on strike. The nurses uh, said, you can't put all the... Uh, patients together like that they'll they'll not like seeing each other when they've got strokes so the the resistance was was very very strong but uh, my another mentor I had was um, Austin Doyle a professor of medicine and uh, he saw all the political problems that were coming 
through about setting up this stroke unit, but he supported uh, uh, Peter and and me to um, to just press on, uh, which we did. And within a year or two, everyone said this is a great idea. Uh, but it was quite a barrier at the time. I might spend a couple of minutes here, Jeff, because this is very useful. And you mentioned uh, the couple of things uh, that are very, very important uh, for those folks out there who wanted to do things. Uh, I think one thing that I have witnessed uh, with you over the last uh, 17 or 18 years since I came to know you is uh, your remarkable ability to solve anything. I have seen this uh, at uh, European Stroke Meeting. I have seen it at, at, this at International Stroke Meeting. I've seen this at various steering committees that uh, you were chairing and I was sitting as a member. You have this remarkable human ability. Uh, the, whatever the other party say, even if the other party is uh, saying that uh, they wanted to do 360 degree opposite view to what you wanted to propose, you somehow get them to come around uh, and still agree with what you wanted them to do. And they walk away with the O oh, uh, and the, the appreciating you and admiring you. Uh, the, the, so that skill, that, that, that human relationship skill is uh, something to be mastered, uh, uh, especially if you wanted to do collaborative projects and coordinated things, number one. Number two, you mentioned one of the other important things, uh, why it is important to have uh, strong academic uh, and uh, clinical uh, the the input uh, both you mentioned the professor of medicine's name and then great uh, Peter Bladen's name and how that synergy was helpful and again this I have witnessed uh, with uh, you the, the since I have come to know about you so tell us uh, tell us some uh, the, the 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 pearls that uh, people can take uh, out of them uh, the I know that people can't be Jeff Donan but people still can learn from him, uh, how, how you gain the skill. In fact, I have a popular joke that if you go and speak with Jeff, uh, even if you want to do some, something completely opposite to what he wanted you to do, you would eventually walk away with what he wanted you to do and thanking him for that. Well, it's very kind of you to say that, Tissa. You're exaggerating enormously, I know, but uh, to, <laughs> to uh, I think um, the... Uh, the issue about um, taking people with you, I think, is a very important one. And uh, I, I think uh, I always like to think uh, what what are they thinking and what how do they perceive uh, the problem, and try to see it from their side so that they can then start to see it from your side. So if you appreciate their thoughts uh, and gradually bring them around. I think uh, they end up appreciating your view a lot more than they did at the beginning. Uh, and I, the, the other thing is to always think about those that are um, around you. Uh, your job, uh, if, if you're, you're a leader, is to make them look much better than you are. And I, I think if you have that view, in most instances, uh, people will agree that your, your view is a reasonable one and, and, uh, and follow you in, in the way that you want to do things. But I, I think the third thing is probably to look at the big picture and say, where do we want to go with this? And uh, there are many different ways to uh, skin a cat uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be... Um, in a straight line, it's preferable to be in a straight line, but if, it, if, it, if it's not going to be in a straight line, as long as you know where you want to go in the long run, other people will follow with you. And you, you, you certainly did live up to that example, the, when the world was not talking about diversity or inclusiveness that we all talk now, uh, you basically, without having any one of those things in prescription, you basically embraced uh, uh, everybody who is coming under your wings and you, you created the whole craft of men, women, whole lot of stakeholders from allied health, uh, nursing, uh, the variety of background, and they are to be seen. They have become their own leaders now from East to West uh, to different countries. Uh, did you see that this was coming or did you... Were you just taking a chance uh, and see what would happen next? 
No, I, I, it, nothing was ever uh, planned in that way. But what I what I did see, and you mentioned um, uh, the team aspect of stroke, because I think one of the great things about working in the field of stroke, which I appreciated from that very first time we set up uh, the stroke unit back in 77, 78, was the enormous capabilities of um, having a team around you from nursing, allied health, medicine, psychology, uh, neuropsychology. It takes, as we know, a complete team of people to achieve an outcome with someone uh, with stroke. And while doing that, I was singularly impressed with the, uh, uh, the native intelligence of so many uh, people in allied health and nursing, uh, which uh, were currently underutilized. And as well as the, the medical colleagues I was fortunate to have working with me, I've had some wonderful um, uh, male and female colleagues from uh, nursing and allied health who have made, gone on to make uh, wonderful contributions. Uh, and I, I could name um, a, a dozen who now are, are leaders in their own field. Uh, and I think this is one of the great advances uh, that has occurred in in stroke uh, medicine as a whole is the is the the team members that go on to make a contribution from every level. And you not only that you attracted a whole lot of people from all over the world. Uh, I remember when I attended uh, your retirement day, the surprise function that your colleagues have organised, uh, and the map that they were showing and putting all the dots. Uh, where Jeff's trainees were, they were basically all over the world. Uh, so the, 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 the thank you for all those uh, contributions. Uh, tell us about your first uh, overseas experience. Uh, the, the, as once you finish uh, your local training in neurology and stroke medicine, uh, where did you go and why did you choose those place, places and any interesting stories that you would like to share? Well, I... I... The first overseas uh, post after I'd done my MD at home with Peter Bladen uh, was at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and um, because I was the exchange person at the Mayo Clinic, which is still going, which is a fabulous uh, opportunity for any Australian is to go and uh, work uh, at that institution, which I think is one of the best places I ever worked in terms of the um, abilities I saw among the uh, the clinicians there. I learnt uh, a massive amount in a short period of time. I was lucky to work with the great Jack Wisnett, who was one of the great stroke epidemiologists uh, of the world, and numerous others. There was Seekert, who <laughs> was, um, uh, you know, we still have the Seekert Award named in his, uh, his honour. There were numerous people there at that time who were pioneers in, in stroke. So I loved that time. Uh, I spent two years there and then I went across to uh, the Mass General and worked for uh, a bit over a year there uh, at about the time just after my great friend Steve Davis was there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a, a common uh, training origin apart from both, both of us uh, going through medicine together. Uh, and then after that, uh, but as you say, in those days, uh, you had no guarantee that you had a position to go back to in Australia. But I, th I said, uh, particularly as I then had uh, a couple of young children, uh, I, I must just go back to Australia. That's the place I want to make a contribution from. And then repay, in a way, uh, the faith uh, that the people at home had shown in me. I wanted to come back and make some sort of contribution. And the, you the, were appointed to Austin Hospital when you came back uh, uh, under Peter Bladen's uh, department. I think uh, we missed uh, one of the useful, the important piece uh, of the puzzle, uh, the, of the not puzzle, in, important piece of your story of your research MD. Uh, as I come to know about it, uh, it wasn't an easy ride for you and you had to get uh, brain imaging done at Royal Melbourne Hospital not at Austin Hospital. So they tell us uh, some of the hardships uh, that you uh, had. Uh, and was that the phase where you coined uh, capsular warning syndrome or was it after? Uh, 
No, that was then uh, with Peter Bladen. And uh, we, um, the, uh, you might remember the, uh, or might know, <laughs> the, that uh, CT scan came to the Royal Melbourne uh, in 1976, I think it was. So in 1977, Mm -hmm. uh, we started to get the uh, early images and I saw this was a huge opportunity, as did Peter, to uh, image uh, people with stroke and imagine the excitement after uh, <coughs> having um, been involved in doing pneumoencephalograms in uh, my early days as a, as a resident and registrar to then be able to see an image with a CAT scan was just mind boggling. I'll never forget that, seeing the first hemorrhage, the first lacune, uh, the first uh, divisional syndrome, et cetera, that you'd see on CT. And we uh, decided to do my MD on, uh, on lacuna infarction. I had enormous admiration for C. Miller Fisher, who was of course of a giant in the field of, uh, of stroke neurology. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, to um, meet him on numerous occasions when I was at um, the Mass General. Uh, so I started to study lacunes and uh, with uh, CT imaging, which, and that was when we started to look in detail about how they presented and this uh, repetitive uh, storm of episodes, um, the so-called capsular warning syndrome came to our attention and the very high risk of stroke associated with it. Although it's not <laughs> common. That was a game changer in the field. I think if I remember correctly, you had 50 patients and you published uh, the original paper in, was it Green Journal Neurology, 90 That's something? Right, in, um, in neurology, yes, in both the lacunes and um, capsular warning syndrome. It, it, it has become a mandatory training for my staff when they come on board uh, the, the, to, to Western where I work. Uh, and I also give them uh, the Louis Kaplan's uh, Miller Fisher rules of residency, the 17 tips. Uh, I tell them that out of those 17, personally, I would pick these things uh, that are quite useful for us on this side of the town and this side of the world. Uh, so the, 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 uh, I wanted you to spend some time on this so that the youngsters uh, who might want to watch this uh, would realize that uh, the, the well, I'm not criticizing them, but uh, while, while they complain that doing PhDs and MDs, it wasn't uh, an easy feast uh, at that time, uh, even to get a CT scan moving from hospital to hospital. And I'm sure you would have had uh, ample amount of challenges. I was, uh, there was the great Brian Tress at the Royal Melbourne, who's the neuroradiologist there, who's also an Austin <coughs> person. Uh, and I must make another point here that... Um, uh, while we all uh, train at our various hospitals and one of my early experiences when I was um, giving a, um, a lecture, I think it was one of my first invited lectures in, um, at the European meeting in, uh, I think it was in, in uh, Germany at the time and I was giving my talk and uh, I heard someone on the side say, who's that? And um, as they said uh, my name and they said, where's he from? And they said, I think he's Australian. And they, they said, whereabouts? And I, I think it might be Melbourne. And I had this light bulb moment that uh, people didn't really um, care about uh, where, where you were. They, they, they understood vaguely you were Australian. What, they might understand what city, but they'd never know what hospital. And that's when um, I realised that you've got to just forget which hospital you come from, you've got to work with your colleagues uh, for the benefit of, um, of stroke generally. And you, where you do that doesn't really matter. I think the, the, the end product is the key to it. I think that the, you basically give, gave me a nice segue to move to the other topic. Uh, this, uh, uh, you may remember that a uh, few years back, uh, we started uh, Donald Davis uh, Advocacy Leadership Forum. We couldn't run it uh, uh, more than two years. But during those two years, I recently pulled out the list. Would you believe that every participant is now a full professor or a dean or some big person somewhere? I'm not saying that we take the credit for that, but Although at least we... The, the credit's with you, Tessa. I think you we, 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 that program. We attracted the correct people to think about it at least. Uh, uh, 
Uh, I think the reason that I wanted to drive this home is uh, you and Steve is uh, the, in fact, if I had power, I would have make uh, uh, each one of you Australian of the year, year after year immediately, because but what you two have done to the world and what you two have done to the, uh, the Australian medicine and neurology is another game changer. You basically broke the barriers and you bought uh, 20 to 30 plus uh, the, the, the hospitals and networks and you made them welcome and uh, you supported them to grow. And you basically made individually small places uh, to a massive, a huge network to the extent that these days, uh, almost no one can read anything in stroke without uh, reading Australian contributions in it. And it is such an amazing thing. And I think I can now see that uh, other folks are taking a leap out of that. I can see our good friend, uh, uh, the Professor Matthew Kernan is uh, uh, the the building the sort of modern neuron disease network exactly what you two did uh, by putting uh, every sort of person together and building up that sort of a network uh, i think uh, i think the the that light bulb moment and you realizing that uh, people really don't care where you come from they they absolutely have zero regard to which hospital that you are from what matters is what you are producing and what you are delivering and which part of the puzzle that you are solving i think i hope uh, that we was uh, of this program would take a note uh, and they would just do the same. And uh, the, 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 the current pandemic that you and, you and me hate to face, uh, but we were forced to uh, take that, uh, has uh, reminded us that the networks are even greater. And uh, it has uh, told us uh, that uh, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, whatever that is happening in India or, 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 or Sri Lanka or Europe, uh, or Africa is going to impact on us, whether we like it or not, when you look at Delta variant, Kappa variant, and this and that. So that's the problematic side. But solution side, if the, the problems are universal, solutions more or less has to be universal also. This was the beginning of this World Brain Day concept that initially Professor Hachinsky was infecting the idea of brain health and then while we were having a sort of a coffee over type meeting, I can't remember exactly, 2007 or 2008, uh, three of us told him that why don't we have a particular day to celebrate brain health uh, and advocate uh, in a one world, one brain health sort of a issue. You know Professor Hachinsky very well. He's a very close friend of yours. Before we knew it, uh, he managed to get it endorsed by the Council of Delegates and we were running a campaign globally uh, the first World Brain Day. This is eighth one, and I'm delighted to say that uh, now we reach uh, anything close to 100 million people. Uh, the, 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 the virtual things probably let us uh, even break more barriers. Uh, the, you are a supporter of uh, neuroinflammatory theories in stroke also. My next question to you is, uh, how excited are you as a, a true guardian of human brain to see two powerful global advocacy organizations, the World Federation Neurology and Multiple Sclerosis International Federation, join hands together to uh, run the ambitious uh, uh, advocacy agenda to stop multiple sclerosis, but on the back of multiple sclerosis, promoting brain health. Uh, personally, what I wanted to see is people talk about brain and people promote brain health, uh, people promote healthy living, people prevent strokes, uh, people control their blood pressure and all the healthy things that you and me uh, talk about uh, day in and day out. How excited are you to see such a campaign despite we are in sort of lockdowns and not being able to travel, uh, the not being able to collaborate and have coffee and have uh, decent discussions face to face? I think this is terrific, Tessa, and uh, you should be congratulated and also uh, Vladimir, and I remember well, uh, he was also, as you know, uh, one of the key instigators for World Stroke Day. Uh, and this has, um, uh, I think, both World Stroke Day and World Brain Day. I think there is no greater uh, contribution than can be made, uh, again, at, at, at very, very low cost, to access and influence uh, so many people around the world. And both these programs have been enormously successful. And I, I, I couldn't um, be more pleased with how it's all gone, both with you, with you and Vladimir. 
uh, to take this to a level where I think um, everyone focuses just for a, a short period of time, but sometimes it can uh, continue throughout the year uh, to influence how people behave and how people uh, can uh, reduce the impact of disease merely by behavioural change. And I think this is one of the great contributions that uh, brain days and stroke days uh, make to the world as a whole. I'm, I'm very, very excited about it to answer your question. And the, 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 I must say that uh, the, me and uh, the Professor Hajinski, we are two tiny dots of the ocean and there are many others uh, who supported and contributed to this uh, and uh, including you, Steve, and rest of the others, one way or the other. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global, it's, it's a team game, basically. It's a team game. And uh, the the my the next question to you is uh, the I think it is also nicely fitting in with uh, what we have talked uh, about so far. As part of the preparation, uh, we didn't have a sort of pre uh, prescription as such. Uh, while we had lockdowns, we still have to advocate for brain health. Uh, so we spread our wings and tried various things. Uh, so for somehow I was talking to various people and. Uh, the, 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 you just realize that uh, how much contribution that uh, some uh, the great men and women have done to this this world. Uh, the, the, I, only as part of this campaign, I realized years ago uh, in a little lab uh, at Dunedin, uh, the Austin Sumner, pro, the Emeritus Professor Austin Sumner and late uh, Professor Ian McDonald as two young men just uh, uh, I shouldn't say skin cats, uh, but working with a cat model and mm. the great Ray Adams uh, just discovered diphtheria toxin could pos possibly be causing demyelination of nerves. Uh, we had absolutely zero idea what multiple sclerosis was at that time. But these two men or young men were basically toiling long hours, uh, uh, the, trying to discover the disease mechanisms uh, of them. And then uh, several decades later, here we are running a World Brain Day campaign trying to stop multiple sclerosis. Uh, it, it's just one story and those sort of stories, I'm sure you heard multitude of them and you yourself have too many of them we don't have time to go into. And uh, the, 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 the next question is, uh, having come through all these things, uh, having mentored uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, the 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 clinician scientists and stroke physicians to the world, both men and women, and the nursing leaders and allied health leaders, also both men and women. Uh, what is your message to youngsters that are out there uh, who are struggling at this point of time uh, with uh, virtual attendance to medical schools, uh, uh, virtual attendance to conferences, uh, not being able to see uh, great debates, uh, although having said that uh, humans are, 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 are really smart people and they have adapted to this uh, calamity very well. Nonetheless, uh, what is your take home message uh, for them? I, I think, uh, as, you, as you say, Tissa, uh, I think humans are very, very resilient. Uh, but uh, getting back to what we were saying earlier, I think um, young people particularly uh, look to their leaders at this time. And I think if uh, leaders can give them uh, some hope that, uh, you know, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And certainly with COVID, I think there is a very much so a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And I, I think it, in to look at this in a very positive way, I think uh, what it's done to the world is make us realise that we can work in different ways than we used to work in the past. And we can work uh, in a hybrid sort of way, uh, uh, virtually and um, and together in in close contact, uh, probably uh, with more virtual than we were, ever were able to before, and I think that's a real positive. So we'll be able to communicate more readily, uh, we'll be able to exchange uh, information more readily, and I already see um, the side effects. For example, um, I know um, uh, s several meetings that go on now where they almost routinely have someone from overseas talking to them directly at their, at their everyday meeting. Uh, yeah. Whereas that just didn't go on before because people tended to assume that uh, you needed to be there, we're going to invite XYZ, was he or she has got to come 
uh, from overseas is too difficult. We'll just we'll just park that. So I think uh, there are so many positive positives that have come out of uh, the difficulties we've faced uh, more recently, but also uh, more specifically for um, neuroscience and neurology. There has never been a time when there have been such wonderful potential and existing advances that are occurring. It, compared to when uh, we were at that stage, uh, when the, the, um, the, the, the so-called breakthroughs, although I don't like that term much, but seem to be few and far between, now uh, it seems to be um, almost every day. Uh, to think that we've got um, treatments for multiple sclerosis, to think that we've got treatments for stroke, to think that we've got better treatments for Parkinson's disease, for almost every condition uh, in neurology and, and look at the progress that's being made in research in motor neuron disease, the, the really tough one to crack. And I, I can almost see that uh, that might be cracked within the next uh, decade. So it's, it's a terrific time to be involved in, um, in research and in clinical medicine. Absolutely. And uh, the, I must add uh, some of the other things uh, that we didn't touch, uh, spirituality, mindfulness, uh, human emotions, uh, basically the way that we behave as a species. Uh, the, the, uh, the, every time when I the watch or read uh, certain things uh, written by the current uh, brain editor-in-chief, uh, Masood Hussain, you get uh, mind-boggling the way that they analyze things uh, and uh, I think uh, the, 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 you're absolutely right. Uh, this is uh, certainly the queen of internal medicine and uh, the, the, there cannot be any joy other than studying this and uh, then studying about us and our behavior and then protecting the most important organ in our body, the brain, uh, as best as uh, we can. Uh, the, well, it is, uh, as uh, I think it's important for us to realize we, we are managing the most important um, part of uh, human life, uh, it's, it's, it's us. And we are the, um, the guardians, if you like, of the health of, uh, of, the, of the, the essence of the human being. We, we just need to drive that message home. And uh, that's the idea of a prolonged protracted World Brain Day campaign. And I'm thrilled and delighted that world is embracing it. Uh, at a, at, a, at a faster rate, whether there's a lockdown or no lockdown, let's hope that uh, eventually we could talk about uh, 1 billion people accessing what we create and talking about brain health. Uh, uh, the, any last take home message that you wanted to share with us uh, on your latest uh, adventure, the Australian Stroke Alliance uh, and uh, where things are heading? Uh, if well, you're I think to also just to... to talk about. <laughs> Uh, just also uh, in closing, again, perhaps a message to uh, younger ones is uh, you, you mentioned my retirement event now, which was, uh, I think, um, perhaps even 15 years ago now. So I, <laughs> I, I've had several careers since, and this uh, most recent one is the most exciting uh, one I've ever done, uh, together with my friend and colleague, Steve Davis, where we are... Um, trying to uh, narrow the gap, particularly in rural and remote Australia, which is, would be a template for similar uh, things around the world, uh, to bring um, treatments uh, to uh, the, the patient in the field and particularly through lightweight imaging, uh, uh, which we see as a huge opening. So we're working with a number of companies to reduce the, uh, the weight of brain imaging so that it can be just done um, almost everywhere in aircraft, in mobile, stroke units, et cetera, at a fraction the weight and a fraction the cost that we have today. And uh, it is one of the most exciting things I've ever been involved in. So the message to the younger people is uh, it goes on and on and it gets, more importantly, it gets better and better and better. Absolutely. I am, I am just like you, Jeff. I'm eternally optimistic. Uh, I think uh, irrespective of the challenges that we face uh, globally. Look what has happened. Uh, I, the, I was very active in COVID-19 front, as you know, over the last uh, 12 months or so. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I didn't expect uh, for us to be vaccinated by this point of time. 
I didn't think that we were that smart, but I was proven wrong. We were smart. Second thing is uh, the way that uh, the latest uh, G7 summit uh, completed, uh, the way that G7 leaders agreed uh, to support mm. uh, global uh, vaccination program. I'm slowly changing the World Brain Day agenda now. I'm basically writing uh, commentaries and a little editorial saying that uh, the current uh, latest history is uh, showing us the way. If we can share vaccines uh, globally, perhaps uh, we could bring expensive MS therapeutics uh, that are not accessible to 70% of the world uh, is more accessible. After all, uh, it's uh, 2.8 million people and uh, the, we know that we have cutting edge treatment. Uh, and when Stro Australian Stroke Alliance uh, decided to add the stroke prevention arm to it, uh, that would be a global solution. Uh, that won't be a local solution because it would be web-based uh, and it would be app-based and it would be behavioral changes. And if we fix this here, the translational effects would be felt uh, in most rural parts of Sri Lanka where I was born, uh, the, or the rural parts of sub-Saharan Africa. I think uh, the, the, the sky is the limit uh, when humans put their heads and brains together uh, and uh, the, 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 the work uh, in such strong networks. So more exciting things to come. We're, we're both optimists, Tissa. I think this is very important. Absolutely. So that's the other take home message to younger folks. Uh, never be pessimistic. Uh, <laughs> be, be, always be optimistic. Uh, Jeff, uh, thank you so much uh, for the discussion. I'm sure after chatting you, chatting with you, I must have grown few extra synapses uh, <laughs> with the inspiration and the, the, the positive, positive sense uh, that uh, we the, the, the carry out with the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, stay well and all the very best uh, with the uh, uh, your newest adventure, Australian Stroke Alliance. Uh, we didn't touch uh, most of uh, your other parts of the career. Perhaps we could come back uh, and talk about your Flory days and other exciting things uh, once the World Brain Day is over. Take care thank and all the best. And, uh, best wishes to you and, and to all the listeners. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Take care.